It's 6.30, so what do you say we have ourselves a debate? Hello, sir. Welcome to Capital Conservatives. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, it's our regular monthly meeting, and we invite you to join us. Starts this Tuesday every month. And we meet here. They can't hear you. Can't hear me, okay. Louder. Louder, he's closer, all right. So we invite you to join us at our regular meetings and become a member of the Catholic Conservatives. We like to get together and inform and entertain ourselves. And this evening's program is what I would call advanced citizenship. Congratulate yourselves for taking time out of your busy schedule to come listen to a debate, fair and balanced, by an informed enthusiast on the subject. Uh, and it's a topic of worldwide importance, and it's going to impact our lives one way or the other. So it's good to be here this evening. We're fortunate and honored to have two presenters for our debate who are committed to their cause and will give us a spirited contrast of views on this very important and timely topic. Uh, Dr. Ray Bellamy is a graduate of Florida State University, attended medical school at the University of California in San Francisco and the University of Florida. Uh, he did his residency at the University of Kentucky and a fellowship in arthritis at Robert Beck Brigham Hospital in Boston. He joined the Tallahassee Orthopedic Clinic in 2003 and specializes in orthopedic surgery and arthritis. Tallahassians are familiar with Dr. Bellamy's opinion pieces in the Democrat. In addition, uh, Dr. Bellamy, along with Mr. Taylor, have been contributing writers for the journal of the Tallahassee-based James Madison Institute, giving them both a fair and balanced forum for expressing their views. Mr. James Taylor is a graduate of Dartmouth College. He then took a Juris Doctor degree from Syracuse University. At Syracuse University College of Law, he was president of the local chapter of the Federalist Society and the founder and editor-in-chief of the Federalist Voice. He was a legal analyst for Defenders of Property Rights, an intern at the Cato Institute, and managing editor of the Commerce Clearinghouse Disability Law Publications. Currently, Mr. Taylor is Senior Fellow of Environmental Policy with the Heartland Institute and managing editor of their Environmental and Climate News. He's also on the Research Advisory Council of the Tallahassee-based James Madison Institute. Uh, sure. And finally, Mr. Taylor is the host of a radio show called Inside Florida Politics on WGUL in Tampa at 8.60 a.m. Saturdays from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. Uh, let me just explain briefly the ground rules of our debate this evening. Each presenter will make opening remarks for seven and a half minutes. Then each presenter will have an opportunity to ask their counterpart a question. Uh, then we go to the audience. So please use one minute or less to ask a question, and the presenters will have two minutes each to respond. Uh, depending on time available, your moderator may ask a question or two. Uh, then our presenters will make closing remarks, four minutes each, and we're going to start by cost tossing a coin. We'll use this silver dollar as kind of a reminder when our money is real. Dr. <laughs> Bell. Yes. Tails it is. In that case, Mr. Taylor, you have the opportunity to take the floor and make some other remarks. Do I have a choice? I'll let go second if I have a choice. <laughs> the choice to just Mr. Taylor. Dr. Bell, the floor is yours. Jack, we do have a timer. Let me Make sure the switch is pushed all the way forward in the on position. Microphone needs to get a little louder. Okay. Can you hear me? No. 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 Give it just a second to heat up. Yeah, it's on. should try Remember, Norm Mears here is the timer. Yeah, it should be on. Try it. You want to reset? And when you see the yellow sheet of paper, Gentlemen, when you see the yellow sheet of paper, that means you have 30 seconds left. When you see the red, that means you're out of time. And 10 seconds beyond that is the, uh, the dreaded bell. 
Can you hear me? Okay. I don't be here. Ready? Ready? All right. As you get to be my age, you realize suddenly that you're not going to live forever. And uh, you start thinking about uh, what kind of legacy I'm going to leave here on this earth, and what about grandkids and their quality of life, and what am I leaving here? And how will I be remembered? And that's why I am here, uh, since I'll be dead before all this stuff uh, goes really, really bad. And I'm not being paid to be here. All right, uh, 90 million tons of carbon dioxide spewing into the atmosphere every day. And uh, that CO2 you cannot see. Uh, you cannot vacuum it out of the atmosphere once it's there, and it's there for a very long time. 95% um, of it's there a uh, hundred years later, some for thousands of years. All right, uh, there's no doubt it's getting hotter. These are the 10 hottest years until January 1, now to 2012, we'll join this group. Uh, as one of the 10 hottest years. And 2012 is the hottest year in the United States. And we set a record for the uh, highest temperature in the world this year. So, All right, July was the hottest month in the United States. Next slide. This uh, is my idea of consensus in science. Uh, you can't get all scientists to agree 100%, but it's pretty close for global warming. Next slide. All right, here's some science for you. Uh, CO2 was in harmony with nature for 650,000 years. And then the Industrial Revolution came along around 1750 and the steam engine and burning coal and so on, and boy, did the CO2 go up. And since 1970, it's really soared. Uh, it's a global warming gas, a, a greenhouse gas. It absorbs heat, and the temperature's been going up. It's gone up about a degree and a half Fahrenheit uh, in the last 100 years and is on track currently to be five or six degrees, probably, or more, by the end of this century. Nobody knows for sure, we can't predict the future, but we're using modeling and, and uh, prediction methods to determine that. You can tell that most of this CO2 here, that's added here, is from human activity, partly by the isotope signature carbon-13 and carbon-14 that can t helps you to tell where this CO2 came from. Um, Alright, here's a problem complicating matters. We're, uh, we're, we're not in control of our population and, um, and they want more energy too. Now if we stopped producing carbon dioxide in excess amounts. Stop burning fossil fuels today, all of it. Stop driving cars. Turned off all the uh, coal plants and oil-fired generators and so on today. We would keep warming for 25 years. That's how long CO2 hangs around and it's continually warming in the future. So that's a real problem. All right, next slide. This is, uh, this year, 2012, in the summer, what happened to Arctic ice. And an amount of Arctic sea ice the size of the United States melted. Now, white reflective ice, like this, reflects heat back out into space and protects us from global warming. But dark blue water absorbs heat, so it's a feedback loop and it feeds on itself and gets warmer and warmer. Now when this ice develops back over this winter and covers that whole surface, it will be thinner 
and faster to, to melt. Next song. Next one. Okay, this is maybe the scariest slide to scientists. This is gigatons, giga meaning billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, of ice from these two areas, Greenland and Antarctica. And that amount, a thousand billion tons, metric tons are bigger than our tons, uh, is going into the ocean and raising sea levels. Next slide, please. All right, here's, here's a predicted 2070 uh, sea level rise. Uh, Miami Beach, all of Miami Beach uh, almost flooded. Uh, societal cost, according to the Asia Development Bank, is three and a half trillion dollars. Uh, Tampa Bay area, 2070. Uh, Tampa Airport, Medill, uh, underwater continually. Uh, Mr. Taylor's home might have to go to higher ground if that happened. Uh, next slide. This is Munich Re, reinsurer, major reinsurer in the world. They said, we know this is global warming causing this extreme weather because we have no increased costs from earthquakes and tsunamis over the last 30 years but we have sevenfold increase from severe storms. Uh, so the insurance industry gets it. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, military gets it, and, uh, and they're worried about civil disorder and mass migrations of people to higher ground and away from drought areas. And the CIA, they got this report. And the, the uh, business sector, Monsanto's, spending half a billion dollars to develop drought-resistant seeds. Next slide. All right, you know, you conservatives know to follow the money, uh, and sometimes politicians um, take money and it affects their opinion. Okay, two more slides. Uh, you've got uh, 10 seconds. Okay, next slide. All right. Uh, I'm afraid you're out of time. We're going to have to get here strictly to time. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out tonight. Now I know what it feels like to be the Gators coming to Tallahassee. The first thing I see when I walk in is my opponent handing out literature on the table here up front with a Media Matters article attacking me. Well, if your primary source of material is Media Matters, that is both very sad and very telling of where you're getting information from. Now, 20 years ago, I used to agree with Ray. I had seen the news reports, I thought global warming was a crisis. And I decided that I was going to do something about it, just like Ray. Now, I had gone to an Ivy League school where I took multiple atmospheric science courses. I knew the peer-reviewed literature, I knew where to find it, I knew where to find the hard data. So I dug deep into it. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that what you hear in the media is not what's going on in the real world. It's not what the scientists report, it's not what the hard data shows. And before long, I decided to leave the corporate world. I took a 50% pay cut to go work for the Heartland Institute so I could provide the truth like I hope to do tonight. I ask you tonight whether you agree with me right now or disagree to open up your minds and examine the evidence for yourself. And that's the best way we can get to truth. Now, in order for global warming activists to prevail on this argument, to show that we're creating a global warming crisis, they have to prove all of four things. Number one, they have to show that current temperatures are unusually warm. If they're not unusually warm, there's no crisis. Number two, they have to show that humans are primarily responsible for recent warming. If it's mostly nature, again, humans are not causing the crisis. Number three, they have to show that a warmer climate is much worse than a cooler climate. Otherwise, where's the crisis? And number four, they have to show that their asserted uh, solutions are going to solve the problem. Otherwise, the discussion is moved. Let's take a look at the first topic. This here is data from the European Science Foundation going back on the top left 100,000 years, you see the last ice age. Then you see the past 10,000 years. Here we are today on the far right. You'll see that for most of the past 10,000 years, temperatures are substantially warmer than they are today. Temperatures only seem warm today because people like Ray compare our current temperatures to the Little Ice Age, which occurred right here about 100 to 600 years ago. 
That was the coldest period of the past 10,000 years. Human civilization developed and flourished during here when temperatures were much warmer. So when Ray presents a, a slide saying all the warmest years in history occurred in the past decade, what he defines as history is just the past 100 years. They pretend these years don't count. When we look at the context of temperatures, we see that temperatures are not unusually warm. And on that point alone, I carry the day. They lose the debate. Well, let's talk about the second point. Nature is the primary cause of recent warming. Here we have these, this data is provided by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Look at the bottom chart. You'll see temperatures over the past thousand years. Here you see the medieval warm period, warmer than today. This is when the Vikings colonized parts of Greenland that are currently under snow and ice. Look at the trend. You see temperatures bottoming out, 16, 1700s, a step up, then another step up in the 20th century. Remember that. Because here you see solar output. This is published in the peer-reviewed geophysical research letters. You see the same pattern. You see solar output bottoming out in the 16, 1700s, a step up, and then a step up in the 20th century. So when we look at the two, carbon dioxide versus solar output, let's see which is the better match. This slide was sent to me by Willie Soon. He's an astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, one of the leading solar researchers in the world. In red, he shows solar activity. In blue, he shows U.S. temperature changes. You see a near exact match. You see the same thing. This slide, again, was sent to me by Dr. Soon. Here you have solar output versus Arctic temperatures. On the right, you have temperatures versus carbon dioxide. It's clear which is the better match. Sure, carbon dioxide will, will, pre will present some warming, but the key driver, the primary driver, is the sun. So at this point alone, once again, I carry, the I carry the day. He has to win all four points. Now we have two points where he's failed. Third, a warmer climate benefits human welfare. This has always been the case, and it likely always will be the case. He presented a few examples. I'll quickly provide a few, and if I have time, I'll address some that he brought up. Hurricanes, we hear a lot about hurricanes. This is provided by Ryan Maui. He was with Co-Apps at Florida State. He's a hurricane specialist. You see over time, as temperatures warm, hurricane activity declines. Here's from the National Hurricane Center, U.S. hurricane strikes. Over time, as the temperature warms over the past century plus, hurricane strikes have declined. How about major hurricanes, the ones that do the most damage? Again, we see here, in the past 30, 40 years, hurricane, major hurricane strikes are at all-time lows. How about in the Northeast? We've heard a lot about sandy being caused by global warming. But look here for the major hurricanes in the Northeast. When we had a lot of them was in the 1940s and 50s when temperatures were cooler. Now the reason why sandy is such a big deal is because it never occurs anymore. When we finally get one, people say it's a big deal. It didn't used to be a big deal. Tornadoes. This is from the National Hurricane Center, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm sorry. Here we see tornado activity declining as the temperatures warm. Indeed, today, today, the United States broke a record for the most, for the longest period in history without a single tornado death. Today. Drought, geophysical research letters, peer-reviewed publication, shows that there's an increasing trend in soil moisture. Droughts have become shorter, less frequent, and cover a smaller portion of the country during the course of the last century. The same thing, Journal of Hydrology, peer-reviewed journal. Summer soil moisture content has increased at almost all sites in the Global Soil Moisture Data Bank. Any way you cut it, a warmer world is a better world. It's more productive for humans. Here's global crop, global crop production. We see here, in the, four, in the five staples, corn, wheat, rice, vegetables, and fruit, we see yields exploding as temperatures warm over the past 40 years. U.S. crop production. Again, we see crop production exploding. How about yields per acre? Even at the bottom, we see yields almost doubling in the past 40 years as temperatures warm. So anyway, you cut it, let's go back here. Whether we want to look at tornadoes, droughts, or what have you, a warmer world is a better world. We're not facing a crisis in that regard. So again, he fails to carry another part that he has to carry to win the debate. Fourth, cutting U.S. carbon dioxide emissions wouldn't make a difference anyway. Here we see U.S. emissions in the medium blue have declined over the past decade plus, but globally they've increased by 33%. China alone in the light blue is responsible for most of that. We could eliminate all our carbon dioxide emissions tomorrow, and all we'll do is delay for about four or five years the increases in Chinese emissions. So his solutions would merely bankrupt us and do no good. Now, when, when, when Ray talks about various events that have occurred, he talks about Arctic ice, he talks about the military in Munich Ray. Okay, I'll leave it at that. But just keep in mind, he needed to carry all four, he carried none. Thank you very much.
Would you please pose a question to Mr. Taylor? Mr. Taylor, writes a Forbes column, Forbes magazine, on climate and environment. On September 19th, and updated on September 20th, you had a column entitled, Antarctic Sea Ice Sets Another Record. And it, uh, here's what you wrote, Antarctic Sea Ice Set Another Record This Week With The Most Amount most amount of ice ever recorded on day 256 of the calendar year. Nobody tell the mainstream media. Okay. Uh, the record also shows Antarctica is warming dramatically about three times as fast as the global average and that the total ice on both Greenland and on Antarctica in billions of metric tons is melting in frightening fashion over a thousand billion tons uh, in, since the start of this century and contributing to sea level rise significantly. Although there is a slight increase in the thin rim of floating sea ice around Antarctica recently, a little thin rim, what makes your statement, which makes your statement technically correct, were you intentionally misleading and confusing the public or were you just ignorant of the clear dangers to the planet of the massive amount of ice thank melting. You. Thank you, Dr. Bellamy. Mr. Taylor, you have three minutes to respond. Does this work? I can use this. Well, I was actually thinking the same thing. I'm wondering how you were so ignorant of the data while you were asking that question. Because in Antarctica, it's funny, you mentioned Arctic sea ice receding, and yet you didn't talk about the fact that in Antarctica, Arctic sea ice has been rising dramatically. In fact, for most of the, for many of the past several years, Antarctic sea ice has been setting records. Here we have above me, we have a slide showing total polar sea ice, and you see that there's essentially no trend over the past 35 years. Now, if Antarctica, when we know, and, and you did not dispute the fact that it has set records over the past several years for total extent, if it were indeed, and by the way, Antarctica is not warming, the satellite data show exactly the opposite. It's in a long-term cooling trend. But if it were indeed melting, as you said, well then, why hasn't sea level rise been rising dramatically? Because we know that during the past, during the 20th century, sea level rose approximately eight inches. Yet since the beginning of the century, the rate of sea level rise has actually slowed down. Where's that, where, where's the sea level rise? If, if Antarctica is, is melting so dramatically, we should see that. Especially since, as you pointed out, in your slide, you mentioned how Greenland, there's a significant amount of ice loss in the past decade or so. What you didn't point out was that during the 1980s and 1990s, those were the two coldest decades in Greenland since the 1910s. It's a good thing things finally started warming up in Greenland. And that is the reason why we're seeing a little bit of ice melt, because Greenland is finally getting back to where it was. Now with Greenland melting a little bit of the ice that had been accumulated during the past two decades, this is contributing to sea level rise. Now, if what you were saying is true about Antarctica also spewing off ice, sea level should be off the charts, but it's not. We see sea level rise is actually slowing down, which falsifies your assertion. And if anybody here would like to have the, uh, the raw data from, from reputable sources, because he didn't present any, I'd be happy to send it to you. I have business cards at the front. They have my email address. That's the way it is. <laughs> Thank you. And... Mr. Taylor, if you would please pose a question to Dr. Bellamy. Sure. I noticed in your presentation that you said that we can expect five or six degrees. Did you say Celsius? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, which, okay. So you're talking approximately, let me see if I've got the math right in my head. How many degrees Celsius? Oh, probably... Three to four. Three to four, because that scientists usually measure in Celsius. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you say if, if temperatures are going to rise three to four degrees Celsius over the next century, 
That should tell us that over the next decade, temperatures should rise between 0.3 and 0.4 degrees Celsius. Here in front of all these people, I offer to wager you $1,000 the temperatures will not rise 0.3 to 0.4 degrees Celsius, and we'll use the objective NASA satellite data. My question to you is, will you accept that challenge based upon the numbers that you yourself cited? Now, the standard for such bets has already been set at $10,000. I, I, I don't understand your... Could you... Let's give them that extra time to... Sure. The, the you, you, claim, of this. you predict three or four degrees Celsius of warming during the next century. That tells us over the next decade we should expect between 0.3 and 0.4 degrees Celsius of warming. Will you wager, I will offer to wager $1,000 that based upon the NASA satellite data, temperatures will not rise 0.3 degrees Celsius or more during the next decade. Will you accept that wager based upon the numbers you asserted? I will not accept that wager, and here's the reason. Because the warming goes on, as I say, for 25 years after that CO2 hits the atmosphere. And so... The, the worst thing is when you get these feedback loops, which then accelerate the melting, and that's well known and understood. And I'm sure you understand it too. Thank so you. the answer was no. I'm gonna pass the microphone to Mr. Null, who will offer it to any member of the audience who would like to spend a minute or less asking a question for which each of our presenters will have two minutes to reply. Thank you. Um, for both of you, uh, Mr. Taylor, you stated that a warmer world is a better world. I don't think the Australians quite believe that, but would both of you list the pros and cons of a warmer world? Who would you like to go first? Uh, feel free. Okay. I don't understand why the Australians would assertively disagree, but regardless, the pros and cons of a warmer world. Well, we know over the past century, as I demonstrated, the global soil moisture has improved. We also know that droughts have become less frequent. We know that deserts have receded. The Sahara Desert is receding right now, as are the deserts in Southern Africa. As I demonstrated, using data, you can shake your head, but tell me why the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has their data wrong when they say that tornadoes are declining and they present the raw data. Irrelevant. Exactly, irrelevant. This is what I'm talking about when we have this debate. People like me present hard, objective data and peer-reviewed studies, whereas the other side doesn't. That's the reason why I went from being a global warming alarmist to being a global warming skeptic. For each and every one of the points that I made regarding, global, regarding hurricanes, tornadoes, drought, crop production, and we could talk about any of the other asserted harms of global warming, the hard, objective data and the peer-reviewed studies show unequivocally that a warmer world, like it always has been, is a better world for humans. Dr. Bellamy? Well, uh, I, I pretty much disagree with everything that Mr. Taylor said. Um, let, let's talk about the first football game FSU played this year. I think it was either the first or the second. It had to be suspended because of lightning strikes. One degree Fahrenheit increase and you have 6% uh, more <coughs> lightning strikes. The, uh, the, if there's a lightning strike within eight miles of the stadium, they have to suspend play for 45 minutes. Now, if you came from Naples in your motorhome for a big weekend uh, and the game's canceled uh, and you're standing there in the rain, how many times are you going to continue buying those FSU football tickets? Now, the, uh, the 150 miles from the Arctic Circle in North Quebec, they're now putting in equipment to cause their ice rinks to freeze because they're melting and they can't play ice hockey up there. Uh, diseases, uh, we know about West Nile dengue fever in Florida uh, in the last year. Uh, yellow fever is a concern, and so on. And then, uh, uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, 30 seconds. Okay, how about forest fires? Uh, the, uh, the, the drought that we are definitely experiencing, over two-thirds of the country was in drought and still is. Uh, 
have uh, accelerated damage to forest uh, trees and they are then weakened and then they're eaten up by bark beetles, sometimes a thousand bark beetles per tree, and then they fall to the ground and they're, they're kindling for these lightning strikes and there have been massive, this is one of the most expensive years in fighting fires and the Forestry Service ran out of money as a result this year. Thank you. Another question from the audience, please. Yes, uh, one question for each of the gentlemen, uh, one for the doctor. Uh, my memory, if my memory is correct, methane is a far more efficient cause of the greenhouse effect. Uh, would it be far more cost efficient to uh, hunt down and extinguish uh, termite population rather than defend uh, disrupt the U.S. industrial process? Uh, the other uh, question I have uh, for the uh, gentleman from the heartland is you made the phrase, follow the money. Uh, basically, who is profiting by the concept of global warming? Dr. Bell, I believe you were first. Okay. Met methane is 34 times as powerful a greenhouse gas, so maybe that's what you're uh, referring to, as CO2 is. And that methane is tending to leak from these drilling sites for uh, fracking and so on, looking for natural gas. And that's a major concern. It needs to be looked into and regulated and measured and so forth. And if permafrost underneath that Arctic ice uh, and, uh, in the far north and the far south, if that starts uh, melting and spewing methane in the atmosphere, we're, uh, we're practically cooked. So uh, methane is a big problem. I appreciate you bringing that up. Regarding following the money, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I mentioned when I walked in, I saw the Media Matters article being distributed attacking me. I think we'll gladly trade our annual budget for that of Media Matters any day of the week. We'll trade our budget for that of the Sierra Club, for Greenpeace, for environmental defense, you name it. The money is on the folks who are claiming there's a global warming crisis. That's where the money is pouring in. Uh, while, and, and just as a side note, while we're talking about the handouts that, that were being handed out, because it's kind of like an extra argument he gets to make, uh, notice behind me, I, I saw that he had a statement from the bureaucracy of the American Meteorological Society in his handout. Notice how they, when there were two surveys of the AMS scientists themselves, rather than the bureaucracy, the scientists agree that there is no global warming crisis. In fact, only 24% in the 2009 survey agreed that most of the warming is very likely human-induced. Only 30% are very worried about global warming. So, you know, you, you can make the media matters assertions about money. We'll take their budget any day. And the quality of the information he's handing out is silly. Another question from the audience? You know, it's not just the U.S. Europe has had the warmest decade in the, since pre-industrial times, the warmest decade in history, in recorded history. Now, yesterday, I think just two days ago, Australia had the hottest day on record. Now, when you realize that, you may agree or disagree that, that global warming is happening, but if you agree, what's happening is that we're ha we have a built infrastructure, cities are on coastal areas, and if you agree that it's happening, then it's gonna impact this country and this world such that insurance companies can't afford to insure. And, and so the question is, what is your uh, response to the risks associated with, with flooding if you, if you believe that, uh, that the, the oceans will rise in human-induced, whether or not you believe it's human-induced? As I mentioned during my presentation, you'll see the temperatures are only the warmest in history when we talk about the past 100 years or comparing them to the Little Ice Age as you did. Going back over the past several thousand years when human civilization developed, human civilization flourished when temperatures were warmer. Indeed, I'm a history buff. If you've watched the Little Ice Age series like I have, and the Dark Ages like I have, and the Plague like I have, you'll see that it's when temperatures are warmer that human population has expanded and human welfare has benefited. Now, you made a question about floods. It's one of the few that I didn't mention in my presentation, but I have slides for because it frequently comes up. Here in Geophysical Research Letters, this is a peer-reviewed publication. Scientists report a decline in extreme weather events such as floods. The scientists report the conterminous U.S. is getting wetter, but less extreme. Similarly, Journal of the American Water Resources Association, another peer-reviewed publication, found that there's broad evidence for increased magnitudes of low and moderate stream flows, but there's less evidence of high stream flows. 
only a small proportion of gauges show upward trends in the annual maximum average daily discharge. And indeed, here we have, this is data from the National Climatic Data Center. We see that to the extent we're seeing a little more uh, precipitation as the planet has warmed, that precipitation is occurring primarily in the fall, somewhat in the summer. Those are the two drought seasons. That's the reason why soil moisture is improving in droughts that have preceded. The spring flood season doesn't see any increase, well, very, very modest increase. But as mentioned in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, studies that I presented, where we're seeing the increase in precipitation and stream flows is that the low stream flows are becoming a little, having a little bit more water in them. High stream flow events are not increasing at all. That's peer-reviewed studies, and that's hard data from the National Climatic Data Center. We can talk about anecdotes here and there. The world's a big place. There are more than 100 countries in the world. Statistically, at least one country in the world each year should experience its worse than 100 years drought or worse than 100 years floods. But these are the hard data going back over 100 plus years showing that as temperatures warm, the weather becomes less extreme and better for humans. Dr. Bellman. I forget what the question was now. <laughs> Would the ask her please, uh, in a nutshell, rephrase given, the question? Given that, it, given that the weather is the hottest it's been in recorded history in Europe, as well as in America, and it's evident that there are unseasonably large flood flooding in different parts of the world, uh, that we have a more of a built up, 100 years ago it doesn't matter, we now have major urban population, 70% of the population of the world is on the coast, and it appears that those 70% this year, not 150 years ago, is going to be flooded. And it's going to be okay, thank you. Yeah. Would you run with that, please? All right. Uh, let me respond to part of that. Um, previous droughts in history have been followed by eventual recovery because the underlying cause of the drought was some temporary phenomenon. We're not in that anymore. The scientists understand that the droughts are... We're, we're, we're going to have trouble recovering from any of these events. The, the warming is going to continue. If we held CO2 to present day levels, we would continue, which is very difficult with that population increase and all the other issues. We would continue to warm for 300 years. We've got to reduce our CO2 output if we're going to deal with this dramatically. All right, another question? I turned my mic off because we have a little background noise here. Um, I know we all have limited information or different amounts of information and I and because of that I too have, it, have, have done research and I don't know what um, sources to go to but when I think about um, global warming, y'all are talking about 10 years, 250 years. Well, the Earth is, I think, a billions of years old, and, and, and if not billions, still millions. And, and how many ice ages have we had, and how many of those heat, heat uh, rises have we had over all those years? And, and I, I remember in the past few years, there was an announcement that um, the Earth had changed its tilt a little bit. And I mean, I, I know it's minuscule, but still, it was it, it could affect what's going on in the Earth. And I'm wondering how many other factors are not taken into consideration besides the, the carbon dioxide. And and um, I also am wondering about the the rotation and revolution of the Earth. I mean, because we're turning and then we're doing this, and our solar system is doing this, and and they're talking about their suns out there that we don't even know about or that are so far away. Perhaps they're affecting us or not, but if we're all moving around, if all of these various systems are moving around, and, and it all has to do with getting closer to the sun over the millions or billions of years, has anybody even looked at, at those? Um, um, Is there a question? I just did. Okay. <laughs> Uh, has anybody taken all the yeah variables? That's the word I'm trying. Okay. Has anybody taken those uh, variables into consideration in all their research? Dr. Bell, you talked Yeah, yeah. All those variables are, are have been looked at as well as you can from the historical rep record. In that tilt business, right now we have almost a circular orbit. Uh, 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 
and around the sun, and so the sun issue is not much of a problem. But in the past, the, the, there are certain cycles that go over thousands of years. Uh, 125,000 years ago, uh, there was a time when we had CO2 as high as we do now because of our closeness to the sun. When, we, when the water gets hot in the ocean, it releases CO2 in the atmosphere, and, and it got about that five, six, seven degrees hotter then, and uh, sea level was about 15 to 20 feet higher then. It's, it's, um, I have to shake my head just uh, in amusement. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but to say that carbon dioxide has driven temperature changes over the span of time he's talking about is just silly. Um, what you see here above me on the top, you see the ice age fluctuations. This is from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You see the ice age fluctuations over a period of hundreds of thousands of years. Now, carbon dioxide has not been driving that. That's been solar output and some of the other factors you talked about. What's also interesting, look at the top. You'll see the current temperatures on the far right. Notice how for the past several interglacial warm periods, these very brief periods between the ice ages, temperatures have been warmer than they are today. We're not exceptionally warm, especially here, as I mentioned in my first slide. In the past several thousand years, we're only warm when we compare our temperatures to the Little Ice Age. We're only setting records if we, present, if we pretend there were no records before the Little Ice Age. Here, this slide from uh, peer-reviewed and geophysical research letters shows the solar output perfectly mirrors temperatures over a span of hundreds of years. We see the same thing during the 20th century. This is from Dr. Willie Soon from the Harvard, Center for, or Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Further, we can look at temperatures going back once again. Here we see temperatures over the past several hundred thousand years. This time, current temperatures are on the left. Notice how, first of all, temperatures in the previous interglacial warm periods were all warmer than today. We're not in some unusual, unprecedented warm period. We're actually quite cool for an interglacial warm period. What you'll also notice is that, on average, these interglacial warm periods last for about 10,000 years. Does anyone remember from the first slide how long our present interglacial warm period has been going on? About 10,000 years. The, the issue that concerns me far more than any global warming crisis that is not a crisis is the time when we're going to return to these Ice Age conditions that we're just about due for today. Hi. Uh, I do a little freshman chemistry uh, calculation. It turns out that for every 88,590 molecules in the atmosphere, 33 of those molecules are CO2. But only one of those 33 molecules is actually caused by man. So if this one little molecule in our dose is causing all the global warming, I wonder how you're able to eliminate such things as, first of all, the other 32, which is naturally occurring, uh, CO2. How do you eliminate water vapor, which happens to be about 10 times the, well, it's 95% of the concentration of the greenhouse gases, and it's about a 10 times stronger infrared absorber than CO2 is. What about the sun, the solar effects? <coughs> Scientifically, you would have to eliminate all of those factors if that one little molecule of CO2 created by man was causing all of these problems. Mr. Taylor, if you'd go first this time, please. Sure thing. You bring up a very good point. I mean, our atmosphere is only 0.04% carbon dioxide. That's up over the past 100 years from 0.03% carbon dioxide. That's the total amount of carbon dioxide increase that we've seen. Um, that's not a lot. Now, of course, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. You add some to the atmosphere, we can expect a little warming. That's part of the reason why temperatures have warmed during the 20th century. But as I showed during uh, my slides from the peer-reviewed study from geophysical research letters, the sun is, is a much more significant factor. Solar output, according to the Danish <coughs> National Space Center, is at its highest levels right now over the past, in thousands of years, in, in more than a thousand years. Now, that's the reason why when people try to assert that carbon dioxide is driving climate, 
That's why here behind me, you'll see the predictions from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Their various predictions are in color, and each one of their predictions every few years, assuming that carbon dioxide increases the amount that it actually has, would be at the top of each color band. Yet the black dots show where temperatures actually are, which is at the bottom. That's showing that carbon dioxide is not driving climate. The same is the case here from Dr. Stone at the Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. We can compare carbon dioxide, here it is, car uh, solar output variations versus temperatures in the 20th century, an exact match. When we compare solar output versus carbon dioxide, you see a big difference between temperatures and carbon dioxide, especially when compared to temperatures versus solar output. And, that's, and that just backs up what I showed here, that temperatures from the 15-1600s are in an almost exact match with solar output. That's a span of hundreds of years. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We'll get a little warming. But that's not the primary driver. And even if it was, for the various other points I mentioned, we're not unusually warm. Warmer temperatures have always been better. And even if you were right on the science, still, so long as China refuses to, uh, to, uh, to give in to carbon dioxide limits, which they insist on doing, we could do all we want. It's not going to make a single bit of difference. Yeah, the, the man who asked that question is correct that moisture in the air is also a greenhouse gas, but the moisture in the air follows the, the uh, rising temperature, and there's more moisture in the air when it heats up. Um, so the moisture is in the air secondary to the rise in temperature. Um, the amount of CO2 from human activity and burning fossil fuels is about a third of the contribution of the increased CO2 since 1750. <coughs> the, act, the, the business about the solar thing, the, we're a little further away from the sun the last 10 years and the amount of heat from the sun has actually decreased. We're going to have time for two more questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, two quick questions. First of all, uh, this is to Mr. Taylor. Uh, you depend on scientific data and you quote scientists and stuff like that in making your argument. But yet, most scientists, the vast majority of scientists, would oppose you. What is the reason for this? What is their motivation? They see the same data. Why don't they come to the same conclusion? Is there some kind of vast conspiracy among scientists? And if so, what's the motivation? And is there a succinct question for Dr. Bellamy you seem to want to ask what's to me? What's the motivation of all the scientists that are opposed to your view, the vast majority? Okay, you're trying to go first, Ray? This is Mr. Taylor. Is what is the motivation of the scientists who are on Mr. Taylor's side. No, no. Yeah. What? Who opposed Mr. Taylor? Who opposed Mr. Taylor? Yes. In other words, the 97%? Yeah. Yes. What is their motivation? Yes. They're just publishing the results of their research. The 97% is a fictitious argument. There have been two surveys in which you have a 97% figure that have been advocated in the media and either deliberately misrepresented by global warming activists or misrepresented as a result of ignorance. The two core questions in each of those surveys, and this, is what, this is what I talked about, about having an open mind. I used to agree with you, but you don't listen. But I'm going to say it anyway. If you do the research yourself, there were two questions, two core questions in these surveys. One was, has the earth warmed? Two, have humans played some role? I, I have told you tonight the Earth is warm. I showed it to you that during the 20th century, we've had a little bit of warming, 0 0.6 degrees Celsius. I said that. I said that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Therefore, we're having some role, but it's not the primary role. So what happens is global warming activists, they take those two questions, and they either out of deliberate malfeasance misrepresent the survey, or they're too ignorant of the survey to report it accurately. As far as whether or not scientists disagree with me, Scientists don't disagree with me. Some do, some don't. There's certainly not anything resembling a consensus that disagrees with me. For example, behind me, you'll see two, two, uh, two uh, surveys. Or uh, First one is the Oregon petition. 
This is a paper. 31,000 scientists have signed this paper. It's a summary of the science explaining why humans are not causing a global warming crisis. There is no, no competing paper with 31,000 global warming alarmists saying the opposite. Additionally, the, German, the Institute of Coastal Research in Germany surveyed 500 scientists specific to climate science or climate-related fields. The key survey question was, based upon the science that we have, can we turn the issue of global warming, should we turn it over to policymakers? Less than half said yes, because there is disagreement. And as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, Ray has handed out uh, a, a bureaucratic statement from the American Meteorological Society. <laughs> the AMS scientists themselves, only 24% agree that most of the warming is very likely induced. That's 24%. So my challenge is if you're going to throw out numbers, throw out numbers that are going to be either accurately represented or that are going to be meaningful because none of that has been the case. And if I could just say one thing, just that the session... That's a question. I just did, sir. No, you didn't. What's the motivation? All right. That's Come enough. on, folks. What's the motivation? Come on, folks. I think it's been explained. Sure, okay. I'd be happy to if you want to give me 20 seconds. Well, you can use 20 seconds in your closing remarks. Okay, very good. Last question, please. I'm down here on the floor. You all can't see me. My question is this. We all know that the fossil fuels contain a lot of CO2, and they were buried in the earth a long, long time ago, and have since been locked away and not circulating between the living part of the planet and the atmosphere. And the ice um, data, to give us a glimpse into what the atmosphere was back to 600,000 years, those data don't go back nearly far enough to capture what the earth was like when all that carbon dioxide that's in the fossil fuels was circulating. So my question is, what was the climate like on the Earth the last time all that carbon was circulating between the living part of the Earth and the atmosphere, back in the Cretaceous? Mr. Taylor, it's your turn to go first. Actually, it's raised. Oh. All right. <laughs> that's all right with you, Dr. Bell? <laughs> I'll go ahead and answer that. If you look at the rate of carbon dioxide increase, I mean, if you want to talk about the Cretaceous or whatever else, it just, it just backs up my point that we don't have any unprecedented amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Actually, we're quite starved of carbon dioxide by historical standards. What we do know, as a matter of physics, that if you double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all other things being equal, we will get 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming. That's a matter of physics, and nobody disputes that. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution until today, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by less than half. Less than half. So you can talk about you know, all the scary scenarios of 5, 6 degrees Celsius warming. You can talk about the Cretaceous, whatever. But what we do know is that from the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we've only seen a less than 50% increase in carbon dioxide, which is a very small part of our atmosphere. Physics being what they are, we can expect that even if we were to fully double, we would get 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming. Now, Ray has pointed out, he's made the argument that there are some factors which may accelerate that. For example, uh, you know, the Arctic ice sheet that's receding. I'll point out that the Antarctic ice sheet is growing, but even more importantly, as temperatures warm, as soil moisture improves, as growing seasons lengthen, as deserts shrink, we see more plant life growing that's also soaking in carbon dioxide. That's why we haven't seen, that's why when we look back at the temperature record, we see temperatures rising and temperatures falling over time. This isn't something where if you just tilt it a little bit one direction, it runs out of control. No, it's just the opposite. There have been cycles to the climate. To the extent we're seeing carbon dioxide being added to the, to the atmosphere, it's being added in very small amounts which tell us we can't expect very much warming at all. That's why we only had 0 0.6 degrees Celsius warming in the 20th century, and essentially no warming this century. So the, the question is, or the answer is, we are not going to expect anything resembling a global warming crisis for centuries to come. We'd have to keep warming at the present pace to even approach the temperatures that predominated over the past several, uh, after the past several millennia, when human civilization first arose and indeed flourished. Thank you.
not true. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you won the toss for opening remarks and you chose to go second, so I'm going to let you go first for your closing remark for this evening. Each presenter has four minutes. Well, I think it's very important. It, it's very good that people are here tonight, whether you agree with me or disagree. It's very important that we become involved in things that are important in this world. I agreed with Ray 20 years ago. I thought we were facing a global warming crisis. I decided to use the best of my faculties and education to research the topic so that I could spread the word. It's when I looked into the data. I have presented nothing but objective data, peer-reviewed studies, and hard facts. This is what convinced me that we're not facing a global warming crisis. This is what's convinced 30,000 plus scientists who not only heard about, first of all, to even hear about the org competition, then to go look it up, then to find it, then to read it, then to decide they agree with it, and then to put their own name out in public to sign it. That's why 30,000 plus scientists have gone ahead and signed that petition stating that humans are not causing a global warming crisis. Now we can talk about anecdotal events, whether it be something happening in, in Australia or you know, in America and the drought that uh, the Ray mentioned, but these things are always going to happen. It's not like there's never been drought before. It's not like there's never been tornadoes. It's not like there's never been hurricanes. When we look at the data as I presented, hard objective data and the peer-reviewed studies, what we see is that over and over again, we can find anecdotes that defy the trend, but for example, droughts have become shorter, less frequent, and cover a smaller portion of the country. This is what happens when the climate warms. Tornadoes are declining as the climate warms. Hurricanes are becoming less frequent and less severe. Any way you cut it, a warmer world has always been a better world. That's why a thousand years ago during the medieval warm period, that's why we had human civilization flourish. That's a major reason why human civilization struggled so much during the colder periods and during the dark ages in particular. In order for global warming activists to show that we are indeed facing a human-created global warming crisis, remember, they have to prove all four points. One, temperatures are unusually warm. They have not done so. Temperatures are actually unusually cool, as I showed. Two, they have to show that humans are the primary cause for warming. As I showed, nature, in particular solar variants, solar output varies. It's not how close we are to the sun. It's solar output. It varies. Three, a warmer climate, as I showed, has been and will continue to be a more beneficial climate. And four, finally, that even if we were to do what, what Ray says, we wouldn't be able to make any difference in the real world. So that being the case, I'm happy to present this data. Thank you for those of you who have listened with an open mind. For those of you who haven't, you still have my love. Thank you. You have the last four minutes. Yeah, um, several comments. Uh, this Willie Soon that he keeps talking about is a researcher whose funding has almost entirely been from fossil fuel industries since 2002. Uh, he has in his stable of folks uh, uh, Fred Singer, who is a nuclear physicist who said that cigarettes were good for us, acid rain was good for us, uh, ozone hole was good for us. Also, and now he's on their payroll uh, advocating that global warming is good for us. Um, let me just finish with this uh, one sentence uh, from his boss, uh, Mr. Taylor's boss, Heartland President James Bass, at one of Taylor organized denier conferences, said the main motivation, well, frankly, there's a lot you and I could for the Heartland Institute being involved in this debate is to prevent the U.S. government from adopting policies which favor renewable energy. So he's, that's what he's trying to do. Is that cool? Is that cool? The up through debate is, yes. Up through debate? Yeah. So what part's it called? Well, the main motivation, frankly, for the Heartland Institute being involved in this debate. End quote. And then I paraphrase to make this short. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what you've done throughout this debate by attacking scientists like Willie Soon, Fred Singer, and then taking the words of Joe Bass out of context. This is what you've done all along. You've misrepresented the science. You've misrepresented the 97%. Mr. I've presented facts. You've done none of that. We're Thank in you. the closing remarks portion of our program.